Hey, I gotta, I gotta find the right button. Hey, everybody. I think, I hope I am live. We'll find out in a second. But thank you all for being here. And who's ready for a hey, I gotta, walk in I gotta, the park? I hope you all are. This is interesting. This is the time of the week where I take the top questions of the week and answer them. I don't make up this agenda. This is what the majority want. And today we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different things. Things we're going to talk about Bitcoin. A little bit on minor capitulation in a video from 48 days ago. Uh, Lightning Network. A lot of people that are in the know about Bitcoin are very in tune with that. Thank you, Pancake Panda. And then we're going to talk about Tesla versus BYD. Should BYD be the Tesla hedge or is BYD better than Tesla? Is it the Tesla killer? Then we're going to talk about ChatGBT, the whole AI plays. Should we buy Microsoft versus Google? And again, look at a whole bunch more. And Justice for All is in the audience. Team Metallica are here. And uh, we'll also talk about what to do in certain situations uh, when you need to raise cash. What should you sell? And finally, we have a new tool called the Digital Asset Portfolio Tracker, DAPT. Very like the DPT in San Francisco, the people put tickets in your cars, but it's not that type of ticket. So let's jump in. And once again, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the mods and chat. And we won't waste any more time. And of course, none of this is financial advice. It's just what some random guy on the internet sees and shares. And the questions come from Patreon. Uh, and we'd love to see you in there. It's funny, this thing, uh, when we started Patreon, it sold out in five months. And then we had it closed for the longest time. But it's the bear market, so sp spaces are available. So thank you all to everybody in the community as well. It's, it's awesome. I love hanging out there every day. So first question is from Cheesy Crackers. I'm down 40% in crypto, but up in Bitcoin and need some cash flow now. There's chatter Bitcoin might go lower. Do I take a hit and cash in half a coin? I, my cost basis is 19600 for Bitcoin in the hope I can buy back the same amount at a lower price later or continue to hodl and raise the cash that I, that I need elsewhere. So let's look at a couple of things and try to find out exactly where Bitcoin is right now. Uh, it's never good to sell things at the bottom unless, of course, you're harvesting for tax. But I did. This is interesting. <laughs> a member reminded me 48 days ago. Uh, it's, it's, it's so bizarre. November 28th, 2022, I made a video called Minor Capitulation Equals the Bitcoin Bottom. Now, I look at history a lot and I analyze numbers a lot. And this was kind of uncanny. And the question was, I analyzed all the times it happened, 13 times in history. And the average return from minor capitulation to, was 11.7%. And I said in that video, the average duration is 48 days, taking us to Sunday, January 15th, 2023. That's why this is important. This is the final slide of that presentation, by the way. And the internet doesn't change things. It's just fixed. And I said as well, 92% of the time, Bitcoin goes up after min minor capitulation. And 62% of the time, Bitcoin goes on a rampage. And of course, I get accused of slinging hopium, but it was just history and data analyzed in great detail. So this is what happened. Since that date, Bitcoin is not up. I was wrong. I said the average return would be 11.7%. I was wrong. It's 30% in those 48 days. And it didn't nail the exact bottom, the minor capitulation, but it was real, real close. So that was a fun little exercise. And the reason I share that, cheesy crackers, is because, you know, are we beyond the bottom? Is it up from here? Let's look at some more data because we like data. That's all we do here on this channel. Uh, the bear market duration. We had the longest bear market in the history of Bitcoin ever. So the first bear market in 2011 was 163 days. The second one was 406 days, the 2013 to 2015. And that was a long one, a nasty one. And then 2017 to 2018 was 364 days, one day shy of a full calendar year. And here we are, 2021 to 2022, 426 days. Obviously, we did get kicked in the teeth by multiple black swan events, uh, leverage contagion, all that type of crap. And the rest is history. But the question is, after being through such a long bear market, are we going to go back into it? And I know if you ask people on Twitter, they'll say, yep, we're going back to 10,000 or 12,000 or 3,000 or whatever the number is of the day. Uh, I think based on the charts and everything else, yes, it could be choppy going forward from here, but also we could be out of the woods, which is kind of 
what 2023 typically does before the happening. So the non-financial conclusion to your question, it sounds like you were up on Bitcoin, but you're down 40% overall on your crypto assets. So basically, I would thin the herd, take a hard look at your poor performers and the weak crypto assets, ditch them to raise your cash. Keep the hardest asset on earth, which is Bitcoin. That's what I would do. And I always try and have a large chunk of my crypto in Bitcoin, because even though other assets may go a lot higher, a lot faster, reclusive man, appreciate you. Um, but other assets may outperform, but the majority of them will underperform Bitcoin. And that's where you need to be. So uh, I hope that helps. Thank you, Cheesy Crackers. Next question is from Mago Fox. Is the Bitcoin Lightning Network making much progress? And if so, will it hurt other payment-related use cases on L1s? Brilliant, brilliant case. So let's deconstruct for those that do not know, what is the Lightning Network? So first of all, the Lightning Network is a layer two scaling solution, kind of like Matic on top of Ethereum. And this is on top of Bitcoin in order to improve the scalability and speed of Bitcoin transactions because Bitcoin is kind of slow, but it's not designed to be a payment mechanism. And the Lightning Network really just acts as a layer that allows communication between nodes for final settlement. And the way the Lightning Network does this is through payment channels. And these channels allow two parties to transact as many times as they wish. And once the final settlement is done on chain, uh, then it's all kind of closed up. And this final settlement still happens on the Bitcoin blockchain. Remember, that's kind of the settlement layer. And uh, once, uh, once the first and the last transaction are required to be written on the main chain, and this saves the main chain from having to process all of the transactions in between the first and the last. So it's actually very simplistic when you think about it and how it operates. But there's there's been some challenges with the development and speed and reliability, but now it's much more mature than it was a while back. So let's compare this to TradFi, which I believe will be heavily disrupted by blockchains and layer ones, and maybe even some layer twos like Lightning. But you think of the relationship between the dollar and your credit card or your PayPal account, and you typically make a transaction with your credit card or whatever account you're using. And it seems like the money is transferred instantly to the vendor. But it's not. Uh -uh. Uh, there's still a lot of final settlement that has to happen where the credit card companies, the banks, etc. have to settle the transactions using dollars or Fedwire or Swift or any bunch of these legacy systems. Some of them have been around for 50 years. So super, super old systems. But with the Lightning Network, the key difference is Lightning is permissionless. Anyone can open a Lightning channel and start transacting with anyone else. And that is the power of this. And this is what we need for a lot of adoption on Bitcoin to, for those people in places like El Salvador to be, use it as a payment network. Now, let's talk about some of the key players uh, and how Lightning Network has seen remarkable growth in the past 365 days. These are some of the public figures visible. Um, and you can look at the capacity on the Lightning Network as well. It's gone from about 1,058 Bitcoins of capacity to nearly 5,000 Bitcoins in 2022. So that's nearly a 5X. And the number of Lightning channels increased 80% from about 37,000 to 67,000. And in addition, the number of public Lightning Network nodes rose 88% from about 8,300 to about 16,000. And part of it is, of course, because of countries like El Salvador adopting Bitcoin, and also because of the backers that are behind it, building and improving people like Jack Dorsey from Square, or now called The Block. And he, he uses Cash App, which uses this. Um, Jack Mollers, of course, with Strike. Adam Back with Blockstream. And of course, our favorite president of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele. So again, it has a lot of potential going forward, but still early days yet. But we have the key best people behind it. Now, there are still room for other payment solutions. Some of our favorite chains have really, really powerful payment solutions. And while the Night Lightning Network is impressive, it isn't without its downsides. Hence, there's much more room for other payment networks to compete for their own niche. First, Lightning Network doesn't completely solve Bitcoin scalability problem. And part of the issue with Bitcoin scalability is its congestion. And even if Lightning reduces the amount of transactions on the main chain, congestion can still occur 
and this can cause Lightning to become backed up as well. And then second, transaction fees can still be an issue. The fees on Lightning are minimal. Um, but the act of opening and closing channels is quite costly as settlement incurs full Bitcoin transaction charges. And further, you have routing fees as well that are required when transacting between channels. And third, uh, the merchant adoption is still a problem. Merchants still have a hard time adopting Lightning, and there are many factors preventing merchants from doing this. A big one is price volatility. Uh, volatility makes it hard for businesses to price products, etc., and uh, suppliers also sometimes give clients time to pay, like 30 days um, to settle their bills. And if Bitcoin's price, like it did over the last 48 days, it went up 30%, that could cause a bit of a headache for merchants and people who have to pay their bills. And this exchange risk adds friction to doing business. But this is why, um, you know, we believe it has a future, but there's a long way to go and other players are happening as well. Uh, with other payment uh, channels. I've covered a couple as well in the past, but I hope that answers your question. It doesn't mean Lightning will be the be-all and end-all, but it is the 800 pound gorilla right now as a layer two on Bitcoin. Next question is from Maddie B. I have found it very difficult to manage a spreadsheet for digital assets, i.e. multiple exchanges, wallets, withdrawals, and fees. Can you provide us with your way of managing your portfolio? A great, great question. And thank you for this. It's kind of coincidental because we've been working on something behind the scenes for many months now, and it's launching next week. So we'll give everybody a kind of a sneak preview. We call it the Digital Asset Portfolio Tracker. And by the way, it may seem like that question is staged. It is not at all. It's just an absolute coincidence. Uh, we've had many requests for this for a long time as well, so it's not new. But it took us a long time to put this together. And a hat tip to DJ for working with us on building it. So we'll be launching in the top three uh, Patreon tiers next week. It does require solid spreadsheet skills because it is a beast. I'll show you it in a second. And we'll have a discourse community open for problem solving tips and tricks so people can, can ramp up real fast. And again, the key of this community is everybody helps each other and shares information. So the first, uh, I'll run through this real quick. This is the homepage. It is a long list of instructions that you need to follow to make sure you can use it properly. And uh, it has lots of really, really cool tips and tricks as well in there. Second, it works for any asset, any crypto, even the most obscure, low volume crypto. Heaven forbid you're even trading that, but it'll work across everything. Even if you bought something a long time ago and you need to track the price and you're still holding it or you found it in an account, you can do that here. You just configure your top list. <laughs> if it's for me, I recommend only looking at then maybe three to five, maximum 10 cryptos, but you can plug in as many as you want. Remember, once you go beyond 50 to 100, the load does get a little bit heavier on the actual system itself. Uh, it also works with all currencies and all pairs. If you're in Azerbaijan or Bulgaria or Costa Rica, you can configure your own currency, which is a big headache too, especially if you live in multiple places. You may live part-time in El Salvador and part-time in the US. So it's important to know what your assets are worth in different currencies. Also, you have detailed market information for all the assets you hold. Stuff in there like max circulating supply, some tokenomics information, price history, changes, etc., etc. A ton of information. So it's a one-stop shop for everything you need. And you can actually play portfolio simulation games in there as well. In fact, this test version has Rand's portfolio and mine. Uh, Rand will be on DCA tomorrow. Reminder, everybody, 8 a.m. Pacific with CTO Larson for DCA. Everybody's back from Christmas holidays. And uh, But that is a, a cool thing to do just to see how things perform. And again, crypto moves so fast and it is a headache, especially when you're dealing with multiple exchanges, currencies, pairs, swapping in, layering in, DCAing in. It can be a real headache because it's designed to solve all that problem. And finally, you have your dashboards to show you exactly how much you've invested, what the current value is. We are even building in some features for LIFO and FIFO. Uh, LIFO is last in, first out. So the last thing you bought, you sell first if you want, or the one you bought a long time ago, if you bought Bitcoin for 4,000, you can configure it to FIFO uh, first in, first out, and you can sell that first and that'll calculate things like your capital gains and all that stuff as well. So that is new and coming. It's hopefully, barring any bugs, launching next week. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see how it goes. And again, 
I can't be on hand to answer all the questions. It has detailed instructions, but it's a bit tricky. So I hope that helps you with your question and we listen to what people want. Next one is from DeFi Kiwi from New Zealand. Uh, you say you do your research and back the fastest horses in a sector. From there, you will look for a competitor who could be the potential next leader. Uh, BYD, a Chinese manufacturer, is making huge moves in New Zealand and Australia and has similar characteristics as Tesla. Is BYD Tesla's biggest competition? And if not, who are the potential competitors? Great question. So you're dead right. I like to, if I have an asset, say Ethereum, as where most people got this idea, or Tesla, what is the potential killer? And I use that as kind of a hedge. So my Ethereum hedge is Solana in that case. My Tesla hedge is, wait for it, I'll tell you in a minute. So first of all, you are dead right. This is the BEV PHEV, which is plug-in hybrid electric vehicle market. And you can see, and this is only H120, well, whatever year it was, but you can see that uh, Tesla is all green, all EVs, and BYD beats them in volume as they go forward. But half of the BYD volume is plug-in hybrids. And I'm a bit of a purist. I don't consider them battery electric vehicles. Uh, they're kind of like cheating. So yes, BYD is the biggest competitor. And then you have other names down the line of who's chasing. But you're dead right. They are the big two. And they are the ones that are scaling up and doing huge volume. And you see a lot of them in New Zealand and Australia by sheer virtue of the fact that they are so proximate to China. So it's easy to ship. And of course, Americans wouldn't be too quick to adopt Chinese cars just yet, but they probably will in the future. So second, let's look at all the financials across these two companies today and where they stand. And I always look at financials to identify is something valuable, too hot, overvalued or undervalued. So let's look at all of my common ratios here and I color code them as well. So things that are green or orange versus red, red is bad, green is good. So if we look at a financial perspective, look at the price to earnings ratio, non-GAAP, FY1, that's one year out and two years out, uh, the BYD didn't publish data three years out, so I don't have the FY3 data. But you can see here on a PE basis, BYD is a lot more expensive. It's twice as expensive as Tesla and a PE of 60 versus 30. Also revenue growth, uh, they are bang on the same. You can't make this up. They're both growing at 50.8%, 50.63%. And the compound annual growth rate, you can see that Tesla has them beat on the CAGR both for three years and five years. If you look at EBITDA growth as well, Tesla crushes it. Now, I always talk about Tesla margins, etc. Now, a lot has changed with the recession, so those margins may be squeezed. But if they're being squeezed, they have so much wiggle room to play with, they should be fine, even if they go down to 10, 15% margins from 30%. They should just be fine, and they have a lot of stuff they can upsell too, like deals on FST. Gross profit margin, 15% versus 26%. Again, Tesla wins. EBIT margin, 16% for Tesla, 3% for BYD. That's not good. EBITDA margin, 21 versus 7. Not too good either. And return on capital, this 5% versus 18% for Tesla. Again, Tesla smashes it. And cash from operations, very similar there, 17.5 versus 16. But look at net income per employee, 3,300 versus 112,000. So again, Tesla are heavily automated. They have the factory that makes the machine, they have the machine that makes the machine, whatever they call it, and the gigafactories. And I think their manufacturing prowess is far and ahead of where BYD is. And that's shown here in these numbers too. In addition, let's talk about quality for a second. There was an interview with uh, Elon Musk and they asked him, did he fear BYD as a competitor? And he probably a little bit rudely, he laughed at the reporter. But let's look at quality. This is a Chinese quality report. And the average vehicle per this calculation gets about 19 complaints per every 10,000 cars. And that may not sound like a lot, but sometimes people have a problem, but they don't report it. But if you look at the top three companies, you got the brand number one, Lixing, I never heard of it. 41.8 complaints per 10,000 is extremely high. BYD Han and BYD Dolphin, 38.5 and 37.3. And on the left-hand side, I circled uh, all the other BYD vehicles. And you can see not good. Then you have Tesla Model 3 and Tesla Model Y. They are fourth last and last, but this is a good place to be last on a report. 
on the Model Y, only 2.2 complaints for every 10,000 cars sold. You know, a lot of people say, oh, build quality tells us crap, it's no good. Well, check out this report in China, and uh, they're quick to complain as well. Let's also talk about FSD. This is another key element. And I'm just touching, it's very, very light. It's not a deep, deep, deep dive, just looking at all the key things that are important to look at. BYD will use the NVIDIA self-driving platform, as well as Lucid, by the way, because they can't develop their own. Again, AI, this type of technology is not their thing, so they'll buy it elsewhere. And we know what happens when you buy stuff elsewhere, when you OEM it or outsource it. It gets expensive and it eats into margins. So that's a big thing. Also, Warren Buffett, a friend of the channel. <laughs> Only kidding, he's not. Um, but he keeps selling his BYD holding. And again, I think net net, uh, despite everything out there, Chinese stocks are very, very risky. That's why I don't own any currently. Um, and I wouldn't own BYD, not only from a valuation perspective, but also all the stuff that they're missing. And it's also not a pure play BEV company. I also heavily doubt they have a solid edge in technology. Now, the final thing, if there was more, this is the Gen 3 platform. This is coming. They're going to talk about this on March 1st in an investor meeting, which is an unusual investor meeting. But basically, I believe this Gen 3 platform will murder legacy. The price cuts they had last week already are murdering legacy ICE manufacturers. But this will enable Tesla to produce cars at half the price of what they currently do today. They just slashed the price of a Model 3 Basic to like 35000 which means with this platform, it is designed to half the actual cost and half the production time. That's what the whole thesis of Gen 3 is. Now, Tesla, just some other notes. Tesla can make a Model 3 in 10 hours, Model Y in 10 hours. Vo I think Model Y is actually even less. And Volkswagen takes them 30 hours to make a car. Now with this platform, they'll be able to make that car in five hours, not 10 hours. And if automakers aren't able to keep up with this, they're going to go out of business. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. And also this platform will help them break into the BYD market where their average selling price is under 25K. The average selling price for Tesla is a lot higher, but this Model 2, whatever they call it on the Gen 3 platform, will crush the numbers as they go forward. And this will also get them to the 20 million car target, 20.9 million cars I have by 2030. So again, despite the weakness in the stock price, we learn markets are completely irrational and 2022 Prove that out, not only irrational, but also full of terrible bad actors. So that is kind of my version of BOID versus Tesla, and I wouldn't consider BOID a hedge. Next in the box is, I read your update on Microsoft buying 49% of ChatGPT. What's the investment thesis here, and are you considering opening a position? And what type of math is behind this, and how much could ChatGPT be worth to Microsoft? Up, Nico, I will answer all of those questions because I have been monitoring it and I have been considering it, but I decided, nope. Let me explain why. So first of all, Microsoft, it is their AI gambit and they have to play catch up. They've been in the search business for 20 years. You know, they've just been crushed completely by Google. And they have no chance. So this is kind of their all in jump in. And I talk about some strategic reasons behind it too. So first of all, let's look at Bing. And this answers part of your question. The Bing... Uh, search today is worth about 60 billion, 50 to 60 billion being generous. And Google search is worth about 600 billion. So technically, if Microsoft, Microsoft could beat Google, that's a 10x upside. That could layer in $600 billion in value to the market cap of Microsoft. And also, most importantly, Microsoft have no cannibalization risk. What I mean by that is if they launch a better search engine that doesn't drive as much ad revenue, they got nothing to lose. Google do. That's kind of the big issue. Also, let's look at the deal, some of the math behind it. Uh, and again, a quick reminder for those that may not be aware, ChatGPT is a language model developed by OpenAI. It's a private uh, AI intelligence laboratory, and it's a private company. So we don't know exactly who is behind it, but I can tell you the funding round was led by none other than Elon Musk, <laughs> so he was one of the first investors into this company, which now has a $20 billion valuation. I always talk about the importance of looking at the best capital allocators on earth, you know, the Jeff Bezos of the world and the Elon Musks. And that's part of the reason why they get on trends early. Look at SpaceX and the valuation of that now as well. Again, do you trust him allocating? 
The answer is yes. So $10 billion to open AI, $29 billion valuation. The weird thing is Microsoft will receive 75% of the company's profits until its investment is recouped. That is a very interesting twist. And after, after they get recouped, they will own 49% of OpenAI. Other investors like Musk and Peter Thiel will own the other 49%. And the remaining 2% will be held by its nonprofit parent. Again, open source technology, nonprofit parent. And that is kind of the key thing to note here. But the question is $10 billion. It said that the revenue for uh, this platform could hit a billion dollars by 2024. That's nothing. They got a piece of that. That's nothing compared to the, the fortune that Google makes. So it's going to be a long time before this actually attributes profit to the bottom line of Microsoft, in my opinion. Also, it's open source. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry venture capitalist is investing. I think 70 different AI companies have been funded over the last couple of months. And it's just it's like Web3 all over again. So let's talk about one of the key things as well. And this is part of the strategic element why I think Google's sitting back for now. And this is a book I read way back in uh, the early 2000s. And it's a book by Clayton Christensen. He wrote it in 1997, May He Rest in Peace. But this theory states that uh, well-managed companies that focus on meeting the needs of their customers may lose market leadership when new unexpected market disruption arises. It's exactly what's happening here. And this is because these companies are often too focused on improving their existing products and, and services rather than developing new and innovative ones. And as a result, they may, may miss out on opportunities to innovate and can eventually be overtaken by smaller, more nimble competitors. And this theory explains how even successful companies can fall behind. And as a whole, the, the history is littered with these types of companies. But this is why companies like Tesla continue to innovate, continue to rebuild. You know, Generation 3 platform I just spoke about as well is a huge part of that. Now, Google aren't sitting on their hands. They do have a plan. So let's summarize real quick here. I'm sticking with Google. Um, they've been crawling uh, for more than two decades, scraping information. They have more data and more success than anybody. They also have two AI platforms. One is Palm, the other is Lambda. I cover them on New Year's Eve. And uh, ChatGPT is still open source and search will still be needed. So even if you go to ChatGPT and you're looking for a new air fryer or something, heaven forbid, that's not going to give you the answer. Also, this has a whole bunch of bugs too. So it, it's... It is brilliant, it's genius, but it's not going to take away the need for search. You know, if you're on the road and you're looking for a healthy snack to eat on a long drive or something, ChatGPT will not help. Um, and the VCs are throwing billions at the space. And as I mentioned, it's got parallels to 2021 and Web3 with A16Z and all those other players. And again, I mentioned the numbers. So um, not that excited yet. Wait for it to be more mature and understand the competitive landscape is still too early. And ChatGPT is incredible, but it's easy to clone or rebuild. And there's tons of competition out there too. So with that, let's talk about the next question is from JMP. Could you please analyze the impacts of Optimus and Megapack will have on the stock price in the next few years? And do you foresee Tesla spinning these two assets out on their own? Um, so it's hard to say if they're going to spin up these things and sell them off. I think it'll all be part of Tesla as the mothership. Elon's been very clear. It will be a $4 trillion company. It'll be bigger than Saudi Aramco and Apple uh, as you go forward. So I don't see a spin out happening, but even if it does, it doesn't mean shareholders aren't rewarded for that. Also, let's talk about the numbers for Optimus Prime. I did share this before uh, in a previous video where I looked at Optimus Prime. And I kind of built a valuation model based on annual factory wages from the loop funds paper. And again, that may be right or wrong. We'll see. But it's just a theoretical model. Like all my models, they can't predict the future. But sometimes they get quite close. Sometimes they're off. But uh, I basically calculated the average bought price, average sale price, $40,000, replacing the average worker salary, $65,000. And the total addressable market divided by salary is about 7.6 million bots times the cost of the bot at 40,000 gives you a $307 billion market. So that is the first piece. Now I go through this fast because a lot of numbers here. Um, second, when you compare the bot and profit attribution from the bot, Optimus, compared to vehicles, you can see my car revenue estimate is about $837 billion. 
and the margin about 251 billion. Market cap will be 10 trillion in the year 2030, potentially, depending on how it's valued. Now, the bot revenue will be about 307 billion, a lot less, and margin 92 billion. And we don't even know if they're going to get this bot off the ground. But the key part here is if they do by 2030, I think they can sell a lot of them because they can easily replace 5% of menial jobs out there. And the share price addition would be $1,180 by the year 2030. Let's look at the mega pack and my forecast through 2030. Again, I assume a conservative growth rate starting 8,000 units, not 10,000 units that Lothrop in California can build right now, but apparently they're building another mega pack factory. But here, just very conservative growth won't be exponential, but just 50, 40 percent. And the ASP will fall down. They say the cost of the mega pack is about 1.8 million. I took it down to 1.35 million. And of course, the price will fall over time as they get better at making batteries. And the margin will be 40 percent, growing to 50 percent over time. And the profit attribution over the years, based on the earnings per share for this product line, will add about $369 in the year 2030. So when we add all those together, we get the following. And again, not financial advice, just projections. Now, uh, it's theoretical and it's a summary. So number of cars I believe they could make by 2030 is 20.9 million. Number of bots, 7.6 million. Number of mega packs, 90,000. And the revenue associated with each is there. And the attribution is there as well. Uh, nearly, what is that? $340 billion in bottom line profit. And if you take a PE of 30 on the share price, you can see that the cars should be worth about $2,000 a share, the bots $885, and the mega pack $408, bringing you a Tesla price of about $3,299 exactly, a market cap just shy of 10 trillion, and ROI from today about 2,600%. Now, that's a 26X, and that sounds kind of crazy, but it does assume a few things. One. It assumes 3.13 uh, billion shares outstanding. That's the number today, and that doesn't grow. Second, it assumes FSD is nailed, but it does not assume a robo-taxi fleet or assume any revenue from the solar uh, business or power walls that they sell today. Now, the most important thing there is I, you know, Elon Musk came out and said it, and I try and sandbag my numbers to be extremely conservative. So if anybody's watching this in the year 2030, I hope to be, way off, i.e. under where the share price is. But Elon has said multiple times recently and back in 2019, he said he forecasts the company's energy business will eventually be the same size or even bigger than the automotive sector. Okay. And you can see from my numbers here, I have it as being a tiny fraction. Let's pull that up again. The energy business, the packs would be, the revenue would be 85 billion versus 830, basically a tenth of the size. So again, sandbag like crazy. But if they can start scaling up these mega packs, they can sell them forever. So again, that's why I'm extremely bullish on Tesla, despite the share price we have right now. And all the FUD you hear that's like, oh, it's just a car company. It's like, even if they nail half of these things, or, and I do believe they'll nail FSD and there will be a robot taxi fleet, you know, the price goes to infinity. Elon Musk also said that too. So let's go to the next question from Tiberius. Now that Fidelity is opening a Bitcoin and ETH trading, should I be comfortable having them hold my keys just like they custody my retirement portfolio? Brilliant, brilliant question and very, very good to be paranoid. So congratulations. First of all, a huge part of crypto is self-custody, not your keys, not your coins. But some do find it tricky and some people don't trust themselves, especially if it's a large amount of assets. So they do put them into custody. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, next, Fidelity have a five-star rating. Uh, you can see I actually use uh, Fidelity and TD Ameritrade. They're the top two here. I know a lot of people are very happy with Interactive Brokers and Charles Schwab, etc. But you can see it's five stars all across the board, pretty much with the exception of offering of investments. And that's all about to change with Ethereum and Bitcoin too. So maybe they'll go to five stars there. In addition, a quick summary on this one, but they are as solid as they come in my opinion. Fidelity is the third largest asset manager on earth with 4.3 trillion in assets under management. Only third to Vanguard, number two, 8 trillion, and BlackRock just shy of 10 trillion. And BlackRock were 11 trillion, uh, over 11 trillion not too long ago. 
They've also been around for 70 years. Uh, they are known for a very strong financial performance and it's considered to be a safe and reliable investment choice for many. But think about it. If they messed up with anybody's crypto custody, there'd be a bank run worth about $4 trillion happening instantaneously. So I'm supremely confident, as you can be, with those guys. And I, I know that people say, oh, not your keys, not your coins. Well, I'm just making the case. If you have to custody with somebody, it doesn't get much better than fidelity out there. And that's a simple fact of life. Next, final part. This is Violet. Uh, she was brought in to, this is our sponsored animal of the day, brought in because of injuries. Violet now a permanent resident and ambassador due to limited climbing abilities as a result of an amputated tail. And uh, she's in the Virginia Wildlife Center. So a big thank you, everybody. And uh, she's very adorable, very cute. So with that, I hope you enjoyed the Q&A session. I'm going to answer some questions live if they pop in here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Oh, yes. I said, <laughs> first question is, do I have a hedge for Tesla? And no, I don't. It's like I don't have a hedge for Bitcoin because there is no other Bitcoin. It's the hardest asset on earth. And there is no other Tesla that I can see. So I don't have a hedge for that. So I just want to make sure uh, make sure that was answered. I saw that comment come in. Justice for all. Thank you for what you do. I appreciate you too, buddy. Um, so one, Brightham, what is your long-term price goal for Solana now? Well, it's it's been quite bonkers what's happened over the last two weeks. I think it's gone up 183%. Uh, it just shows you how quickly stuff can move. Uh, being super conservative right now, uh, again, sandbagging like hell. I know that artificial manipulation and pumping by Alameda and probably other bad actors in the space took that price up to 259 during the heyday of crypto. And it caused a lot of people to get sucked in. And that was kind of a crazy price. But also, you know, you saw Ethereum go to nearly 5,000. A lot of other crazy things happen. But I do believe conservatively up to April 2024, right before the Bitcoin halving, I think we could get to 80 to $100, which actually is funny because, you know, a couple of days ago, that was a 10x if you say 80 bucks because it was at $8. Uh, and people look at you like you're crazy, but now with the price, it's not even a 4X. And that's just the the nature of this beast. It can move real fast. So that's what I say. I'm going to look at more numbers, but when I look at the price of uh, Solana, there's many, many different factors. You know, the number of daily active users and TBL and activity and addresses and transfer volumes, values, all that type of stuff. But also what's very important is how does it stack up compared to other layer ones? How valuable is it? What multiple is it at or what fraction? Because in its bottom, I think uh, Solana hit 143rd of the market cap of ETH. It does more transactions, it does more daily users. Does that, does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense at all. So with that, we'll see where it goes. One thing I can say, everybody, the next three to five years will be fascinating and stay healthy. Stay buckled in because it's going to be a fun ride. I can guarantee you that with the type of disruption that's coming. Um, AG, do you believe mortgage interest rates will return to previous lows in the US and the UK in the next two to three years? So I don't think we'll see the 2.5%, you know, 30-year fixed mortgage rates we saw late 2021. I was urging everybody to do a refi. I did three myself. Um, but... Uh, I do think rates will come down. It's simply not sustainable. U.S. government, for example, I did a mac quick macro video yesterday, spoke about the U.S. government and their growing deficits of one and a half to two trillion a year. It's just, pfft. there's no going back. The, the toothpaste is out of the tube. You can't bring these deficits down because there's simply too much debt. Every time they jack the interest rates, and this is my original thesis, they're shooting themselves in the foot. They're causing financial Armageddon and they're crippling their deficits. 2023 will be a year where they start looking at their books. I'm talking about the government. They look at the income. It's like, uh oh, um, no capital gains. And because of inflation, all their expenses are exploding and nearly a trillion dollars in interest payments because they jacked their rates. And half of US debt is rolling into short term debt over the next one to two years. So, all that stuff, if it stays at 4.5%, that's going to be a lot. You take it 4.5% of a trillion dollars. 
or half of $31.5 trillion, call it $16 trillion, that's, that's more than Social Security, that's more than the defense budget, that's more than every major line item on the balance sheet or P&L of the government. It's just ridiculous. So from that perspective, they have to bring them down. And I do believe uh, you know inflation is well under control. In fact, I saw a report <laughs> very recently, if you removed something like the price of eggs, food inflation, 90% of food inflation for the last month that they measured would have been gone. One item. So that's how crazy the whole thing is. Um, I think realistically, in answer to your question, UK, Europe, US, I think the UK is going to do something for mortgage rates. They want to keep people buying houses and keep people in their houses. So they'll create a program for that. The EU, actually, their inflation is coming down fast, even faster trajectory than uh, the US. And the US, regarding mortgage rates here, I think we might see sub 4.5% 30-year fixed rates versus the nearly 7% now in the next year or so. So time your refi and don't try to nail the bottom. But if you're currently rolling into a, a variable rate, try to do a short-term refi, like a two-year, five-year, seven-year, and then lock in that 30-year. When you see a 30-year, 25 or 3%, anybody over the next 10, 20, 30 years, lock it in. <laughs> it's a thing of beauty. So next question, uh, R. Ahmed, uh, with only around 50 million Bitcoin, will ever be in circulation? Um, do you worry that we'll simply create a new 1% elite, then wider distribution? Uh, no, actually, I've been very, very uh, surprised by the accumulation. I covered it, I think, also in yesterday's video by different cohorts like shrimps and whole coiners. It's just been bombastic. People have been watching. It's interesting. People have been watching Bitcoin since 2015, 2017, 2019. 2020, 2021, uh, that stayed on the sidelines. I've jumped in. A, a friend of mine is a professor at university. You know, he's always saying for years, the Ponzi. Well, he went and bought Bitcoin like a couple of weeks ago. So nailed the bottom by just being patient. So there's a lot of people just jumping in for the first time. Uh, and the distribution is a lot better. Again, the biggest cohort, I think, is that uh, 1,000 to 10,000 Bitcoin holders. And they're about to be overtaken by the 10 to 100 Bitcoin holders. So the distribution from the very rich to the top elite is coming down. Still not perfect, but better than pretty much every other crypto I see out there. Um, Guy Courtney, look into Forever Wild in Southern California. Great rescue organization. Will do. Thank you, Guy. Uh, we will absolutely check it out. Appreciate that. Shark Puncher, buddy. Good to see you. Has anybody looked into red pandas? They are the last living member of their species. And when they die, their entire species will be gone forever. I appreciate you calling this out. And I know in San Francisco Zoo, they've got a couple of red pandas there. We check on them regularly. Um, but, and yeah, um, I know zoos are bad. I'm not going to touch that. But I appreciate you calling this out. And spreading awareness, we'll definitely have a look into it. Vicious Lee, you did a 10K mark portfolio a few weeks back with Solana as the majority of the crypto holding. At what point would you switch the portfolio to 70 to 80 percent bitcoin to go less risk on yes it has been it was a risky move that was the dgen portfolio i did with ran and uh you know everything the, the the key lesson here people thought i was being very irresponsible jumping in there and i looked like an idiot for a few days because i can't remember the price of solana it was like 12 or 13 dollars and i went to eight and i was like oh, oh that didn't work out well and then a few days after that, it's where it is now. So um, when you look at assets and certain prices, everything has a price, everything has relative value. And when things are really beaten down, you should just forget the FUD uh, and not be fearful and, and go in hard. And that's what I did with that. Back to your question of when to rotate it, it depends what other assets are doing. Until I see you know, Solana getting to like 20% of the market cap of ETH, that will be the point where I re-examine how to deploy. And if there are Solana killers or better assets that are beaten down that haven't run yet. Um, but right now, you know, there's so much knowledge out there. There are things that uh, are running fast, uh, even in line with like the old coins were just crazy over the last week. And, and people will always think, oh, Bitcoin dominance, Bitcoin runs first. Those days are over where Bitcoin runs first every degens into uh, alts at the same time. Bitcoin leads, but minutes later, the others follow. Uh, Long-term holder, you rock star. Thank you, Mr. Mike. Appreciate you. MT, 
Um, how does <laughs> this is a question actually related to the one I just answered? How does everything move at the exact same time when there is a turn? All coins all move at once. Uh, so I think there are a lot of algo traders out there and bots, and they look at they look for moves and they look at correlations. So imagine you have Ethereum being ninety percent correlated to Bitcoin. Bitcoin moves three percent, two percent, whatever the amount is, five hundred bucks. The algos sniff that out. They know Ethereum is going to move at least kind of 90% of that move and follow it. In fact, Ethereum tends to outperform Bitcoin. And that's exactly what you're seeing. You're seeing the machines respond. And then once the machines respond and the price action goes up, then the bees swarm in and then they start grabbing some. And that's what happened. But what we what we saw with uh, Bitcoin lately is extreme buying, extreme options action. We saw short squeezes from hell because people are listening to people on Twitter saying, oh, it's going to 10,000. It's going to you know, better sell now, short. It, it's some really smart people I know, they're shorted the hell out of Bitcoin. And they got to cover. And when they cover, if it's options, it causes a gamma squeeze. And it causes the price to go crazy. So that's kind of what we saw. So yes, blame the bots, blame the algos, blame AI, and everybody buckle in. That's why I say as well, we have you know three years to... Be better than the machine if we can. And I'm very fearful what the markets will look like in 2025 because then the machines will be smarter and be able to react faster than we ever can. We'll be left for the crumbs. So um, interesting question. In fact, I should do a video on bots and how they actually do work. MT, great question. And <laughs> thank you all. Next, I want to thank everybody for the super stickers. Pancake Panda, Justice Rule. Matt Vogg, Green Candle, AC1, Reclusive Man, Mr. Hammer, The Eternal One, and Kiwi Robin, Jim Hoff 14, Silicon Valley Stoic. I <laughs> love you. Good to see you here too. And everybody, if you have ideas for this, if it's too long, too detailed, too many numbers, not enough numbers, let me know below. I work for you all. And Chiku Chiku, appreciate you too. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a great Sunday with friends and family. Rest, relax, get away from the markets. You know, uh, it's not healthy to look at the markets. But since I started, Bitcoin went up $89 of whatever that's worth. So thank you all. Love you all. See you soon.